Welcome to Connecting with God from Thoughts and Solitude by the Reverend Thomas Merton, Vegetarian, Part 1 of 2 on Words of Wisdom. The Reverend Thomas Merton, an important Catholic mystic and spiritual thinker, was born in 1915 to an American mother and a New Zealand father. The many life situations he encountered in his youth led him to explore religion and spirituality and eventually to devote his life to God by becoming a monk and later a deacon at the Abbey of Gethsemane, a part of the Order of Trappists in Kentucky, USA. He also enjoyed living alone in a hermitage in the monastery's wilderness area. During his monastic life, Thomas Merton developed his writing talent by translating religious texts and writing biographies. He also penned poetry, as well as books and articles on topics ranging from spirituality to social justice and peace. One of Merton's most famous statements was, For me to be a saint means to be myself. Therefore, the problem of sanctity and salvation is in fact the problem of finding out who I am and of discovering my true self. He also said, we are living in a world that is absolutely transparent and God is shining through it all the time. This is not just a nice story or a fable, it is true. Believing in the equality of all religions, Thomas Merton became deeply interested in Eastern traditions in the later years of his life. He also held lively discourses with His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, Today, the life and works of the wise reverend are still studied at the Thomas Merton Center in Kentucky, USA and the International Thomas Merton Society. Today, we will present selections from Thomas Merton's book, Thoughts in Solitude, where the wise reverend explains his love for God and the importance of prayer. Part two, the love of solitude, chapter 10. Let this be my only consolation, that wherever I am, you, my Lord, are loved and praised. The trees indeed love you without knowing you. The tiger, lilies, and cornflowers are there proclaiming that they love you without being aware of your presence. The beautiful dark clouds ride slowly across the sky, musing on you like children who do not know what they are dreaming of as they play. But in the midst of them all, I know you, and I know of your presence. In them, and in me, I know of the love which they do not know, and what is greater. I am abashed by the presence of your love in me, the love that you have given me, and which could never be in my heart if you did not love me. For in the midst of these beings which have never offended you, I am loved by you, and it would seem most of all as one who has offended you. I am seen by you under the sky, and my offences have been forgotten by you, but I have not forgotten them. Only one thing I ask, that the memory of them should not make me afraid to receive into my heart the gift of love, which you have placed in me. I will receive it because I am unworthy. In doing so, I will only love you all the more, and give your mercy greater glory. Remembering that I have been a sinner, I will love you, in spite of what I have been, knowing that my love is precious because it is yours, rather than my own. Precious to you because it comes from your own son, but precious even more because it makes me your son. Chapter 11 Vocation to Solitude To deliver oneself up, to hand oneself over, entrust oneself completely to the silence of a wide landscape of woods and hills or sea or desert, to sit still while the sun comes up over that land and fills its silences with light. To pray and work in the morning and to labor and rest in the afternoon and to sit still again in meditation in the evening when night falls upon that land and when the silence fills itself with darkness and with stars. This is a true and special vocation. There are few who are willing to belong completely to such silence to let it soak into their bones, to breathe nothing but silence, to feed on silence and to turn the very substance of their life into a living and vigilant silence. The desire for solitude must be supernatural if it is to be effective and if it is supernatural, it will probably also be a contradiction of many of our own plans and desires. 
We may indeed look ahead and foresee and desire the path that leads us to the desert, but in the end, solitaries are made by God and not by man. No matter whether we be called to community or to solitude, our vocation is to build upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and on the chief cornerstone, which is Christ. This means that we are called to fulfill and to realize the great mystery of his power in us, the power that raised him from the dead and called us from the ends of the earth to live, to the Father in him. Whatever may be our vocation, we are called to be witnesses and ministers of the divine mercy. The Christian solitary does not seek solitude merely as an atmosphere or as a setting for a special and exalted spirituality. Nor does he seek solitude as a favorable means for obtaining something he wants, contemplation. He seeks solitude as an expression of his total gift of himself to God. His solitude is not a means of getting something, but a gift of himself. Chapter 12 the solitary life is above all a life of prayer. We do not pray for the sake of praying, but for the sake of being heard. We do not pray in order to listen to ourselves praying, but in order that God may hear us and answer us. Also, we do not pray in order to receive just any answer. It must be God's answer. Therefore, a solitary will be a man who is always praying and who there is always intent upon God solicitous for the purity of his own prayer to God, careful not to substitute his own answers for God's answers, careful not to make prayer an, an end in itself, careful to keep his prayer hidden and simple and clean. In so doing, he can mercifully forget that his perfection depends on his prayer. He can forget himself and live in expectation of God's answers. It seems to me that this is not quite comprehensible if we forget that the life of prayer is founded on prayer of petition no matter what it may develop into later on. Far from ruining the purity of solitary prayer, petition guards and preserves that purity. The solitary more than anyone else is always aware of his poverty and of his needs before God. Since he depends directly on God for everything material and spiritual, he has to ask for everything. His prayer is an expression of his poverty. For more information about Thomas Merton, vegetarian, please visit merton.org. I feel stronger than I've ever been, mentally, physically, and emotionally. My plant-based diet has opened up more doors to being an athlete. It's a whole other level that I'm elevating to. Hannah Teeter, vegetarian. Gracious viewers, thank you for watching today's Words of Wisdom. 